I understand I was going to speak to uh, relatively young people today, so I thought, well, since I had this opportunity, I would try to give you some sense of maybe how to construct a meaningful life for yourself. So that's the way I decided to enter this arena. And uh, what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about some experiences I've had with my kids, watch them growing up, and see how they ended up. Uh, and also wanted to talk a little bit about happiness and how you bring happiness into your life and what's the relationship between having a meaningful life and being happy. Some years ago when my kids were growing up, people would always come over to me and ask me, so what do you really want for your kids? And the, the answer that I would always give is that, you know, I'd be happy if my kids just grew up and had a happy life, if they grew up and were happy. And then I started looking around, and I noticed that a lot of young people were spending a good part of their day riding skateboards, going down to the beach and surfing all day. You know, people were spending an awful lot of time at shopping malls, buying things they probably didn't need, or had dozens of. And of course, playing video games, or watching TV for hours and hours. And I was saying to myself, these kids actually look relatively happy, but is that what I want for my kids? And I said, you know, that's not enough. The one thing you don't want to happen in your life is get to an end of your life and say, is that all there is? And for a lot of these kids, and frankly, a lot of them weren't kids at all. They were 30, 40 years old, running around the city on skateboards. I was wondering, what is this all about? So I decided to look into this question of happiness. And there are actually a lot of reasons why people you know, can move towards a level of happiness. But I thought I would at least come up with five relatively important ones for you and talk a little bit about them. What contributes to your level of happiness? Five possibilities. Let's talk about the first. The relationships you have with other people. Now, frankly, this is probably the most important indicator or factor that goes into one's happiness level. And in fact, if you ask thousands and thousands of people what makes them most happy in life, they would say it's their relationship with other people, with their family, with their friends, with the significant group of people around them that care about them, the notion of love, love in your life, relationships. And in fact, this shouldn't come as a surprise. And it's one of the reasons why Facebook is so important, because we are social animals. We love to be in contact with folks. And it's difficult to be alone. You may have heard of a gentleman. His name was Chris McCandish. Did you ever hear of the book called Into the Wild? This young man graduated from college, decided he was going to give away all of his money, about $25,000 that he had inherited. He gave it away to charity. And he went out to the wilderness to find peace and happiness. And he eventually ended up in the backwoods of Alaska in an old bus that he had found there. And over the course of several months, he eventually died of starvation. And in the process of dying, he would write these journals. And when they came and found him in this bus, frozen to death and very, very, very undernourished, they found his journal. And what he said was, happiness is only real when it is shared. And it's one of the things that he said that made him famous. And people today go actually out to this bus to find his journal and to find his life there. But he died all alone. And he realized that when he was out in the woods and he was looking at all these beautiful scenes, that it really didn't mean that much because he was all alone. So if you want to be happy in your life, you've got to nurture your relationships. You've got to have friends, people around you. Don't go at life all alone. Probably not a good idea. So what's another thing that we should consider with regards to happiness? One of the most important things is simply to consider your state of mind. We have a lot of power over our own attitude. It's very, very important to be optimistic, not pessimistic. It's very important to look at the good side of things, to learn from your mistakes, 
and to move forward and not to concentrate on the things that are negative, to be positive. So if that's something we have control over, then we have a lot of control over our nature and our happiness level. So keep that in mind. One of the words, or one of the things that I often quote from the Dalai Lama, and he says this quite often, if the problem has a solution, why worry about it? Just fix it. If the problem doesn't have a solution, why worry about it? Because you can't fix it. So you probably should keep that in mind in life as well. There are certain things you're not going to be able to fix. So why get all bummed out? All right. Enough about your state of mind. Now, some people say, come on, Tom. How can you not avoid attachments? Well, the truth of the matter is that we all have a limited amount of time on this planet. And while we're here, many, many things are going to go through our lives. We're going to have friends that someday are here and someday disappear. We're going to have marriages that some might, may not work out. We have pets that die. I have friends that love their pets so much that when that pet dies, since pets only last about 10 or 12 years, I don't know what's going to happen to this person. So you have to realize that there is a certain amount of impermanence in life. And that essentially we have to keep that in mind and not get too attached to things because when they are lost, it drives people into depression. And of course, that can be quite dangerous. The other thing is you don't want to get attached to things that are negative. You don't want to get attached to drugs, pornography, all sorts of things that occupy your life that bring nothing to it. So you need to keep all of that in mind. Addictions of all kinds really destroy and take away your life. Just don't do it. Number four, you've got to give yourself permission to be human. The truth of the matter is that we are all imperfect, that uh, we all make mistakes, that a lot of you might believe that you're a perfectionist, or that maybe you are close to perfect, but no one really is. So don't fool yourself. And anytime you make a mistake, don't kick yourself in the butt. Forgive yourself and forgive others. It'll make you a better person. Learn from your mistakes and move on. And every time we make a mistake, you always need to take away, OK, what was the lesson there? And how can I not do that in the future? Finally, if you want to bring some meaning and happiness into your life, think about your work. I got bad news for you. You are probably, well, work is going to take up about a third of your life. The other third is sleep, and the other third is everything else. So if you can find yourself a job that's, in fact, pleasurable and, quote, meaningful, you've done a lot to change your life. The last thing you want to do is sit at a job you hate. The what you really want to do is wake up in the morning and want to go to work because you love it. Now, it's not always easy to get the job of, of that that's going to bring you a lot of joy. But that's the target. Set a target for yourself and then work towards it. Without a target, you'll never get there. But if you don't take on a job that you love, you've essentially given away a third of your life. And you only get one life. Now, I have a friend who used to teach at Harvard. He studied happiness for many, many years. And in the process of studying and teaching about happiness, he said happiness lies at the intersection between pleasure and meaning. The intersection between pleasure and meaning. So if, if you can take on a job that's actually pleasurable and, in fact, meaningful at the same time, you've pretty much scored. That's it. You've hit it. And in fact, if you think of the times in your life that you've been both happy and done something meaningful, it was probably the best time in your life. The time you graduated from college, or the time you, your wedding day, 
or the first birth of your child, or the chi birth of your first child. All of these things had meaning and you were happy at the same time. So it's really the apex of joy. Keep that in mind as you walk through life. Try to pepper your life with those kinds of incidents and you'll do fine. Okay, so what does this all mean? What gives life meaning? So I wrote this down thinking that this is probably pretty close to what gives life meaning. Do something or many things which leave the world in a better place for you having been here. You don't want to get through life without a story, without an opportunity to help people, without something positive to tell people. If you've gone through life without a story, you haven't had much of life. So build stories around compassion, around giving, and I think you'll be fine. By the way, another friend of mine who writes for the New York Times, you may have seen him on NPR many, many times, David Brooks, recently wrote a, a book called The Road to Character. And what he talks about there is good people. What are the kinds of elements that go into a good person? What really builds character? And too many of us spend an awful lot of time building resumes to get a fancy job somewhere or something along those lines, and not enough time thinking about our eulogy. And the truth of the matter is that when you die, no one's going to read your resume. It's not that important. What's important is whether or not you led a decent, good life. And how do you do that? It's not that difficult. You can bring goodness into your work. You can do good for family members. You can do good for friends. You can do good for strangers. That's what they'll remember the day you die. That's what will be in your eulogy, not your resume. So think about that. Now, let me uh, say one other thing. And my guess is that you've all had some experience with this. What's really wonderful about leading a life that's meaningful and giving and caring for others is that it feels so damn good when you do it. When you've helped a friend or a family member or a stranger, when you've stopped on the street and given a guy uh, who's hanging out on the street and hasn't had a decent breakfast or anything else, has frozen his butt off all night, and you give them a blanket, or you give them a cup of coffee, or you even just say a few words to that person, that's something. And you walk away feeling good about that. And there's nothing better than feeling good. Not only makes you a better person, it makes the people you reach a better person. Now, let me tell you one more story. I, I don't know if you've heard, but years ago, I brought the Dalai Lama to the University of San Francisco. He and I have been friends for many, many years. Uh, and I sometimes visit him in India, northern India, where he lives. And on one such occasion, he had heard that I was in and around his village. And he invited me up to his home. And I spent the day at his home in what he calls his audience room, where he greets other people from all over the world. People come and simply sit and talk to the Dalai Lama. And I felt blessed to be in the room. I wasn't going to participate or anything, but I was just going to sit around, hang around, see what goes on. So within a few minutes, this gentleman comes into the room with his wife and three children. And he's from Mumbai, India. And uh, you could tell he's quite wealthy. They have very nice clothes. They have lots of jewelry. They speak English impeccably. Probably went to a lot of private schools. You can certainly tell he's quite wealthy. And so the family sits down with the Dalai Lama, and they have this conversation for almost an hour. And the conversation is really a conversation that's quite simple. The gentleman asked the Dalai Lama how he manages to retain so much joy in his life in spite of the fact that so many difficulties he's had. What is this thing called Buddhism? What is the meaning and purpose of life? What kind of problems do you have? And they would talk back and forth. 
And at the end of this conversation, the gentleman stands up with his family and he says, could you do me one more favor before we leave you? And the gentleman says, could you bless me and my family? And I thought for sure the Dalai Lama would bless them. I've seen the Dalai Lama bless thousands of people. The Dalai Lama's blessed me, blessed my daughter. But the Dalai Lama said this time, you know, I really don't like to bless people. We've just had this conversation. You've realized that I have the same problems you have. We're just two simple human beings trying to get through life the best way we know how. We are the same. You could bless me. Why should I bless you? We are human brothers. And then the Dalai Lama said, and that really, of course, speaks to the Dalai Lama's humility, which is something, a quality I really hope that many of you have. But then the Dalai Lama said, but if you wish to feel blessed, go back to Mumbai from where you've come and help all of those people in and around you who have so little and suffer so much, and in return, you'll feel blessed. And that's really the pouring of my time with you. Please, please, please try to incorporate giving and caring for others into your life. Embed it there, not just on Thanksgiving or Christmas or those kinds of days, but every day. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. It could be something small. But it'll make you a better person. It'll affect the world in a better way. And of course, it'll make this whole conversation worthwhile. So thanks a lot for spending some time with us.